Well, that's just a glimpse of how God is working in the heart of one person and their group. And we would never know that, but that's being multiplied over and over through our church, and that's why we do encounters. And that's why when we ask you, hey, would you just share your story? It's not always stories of victories. Sometimes it's stories of pain and faithfulness. But they're stories of how God is at work, and we get encouraged. I was pumped. I'm like, I want to be part of that group. I just have an age problem to fit into the young adults group. But otherwise, that would be a great group to be a part of, learning the word, interacting, asking questions, raising things. And nothing fires Lillian up more than her group. Uh, Carla brought that out, and I agree with that, that it's amazing how God is working through her and doing a work in the lives of those that are in her group. In fact, I want to pray for us. Let's bow our head. Jesus, today we are here to do exactly what Lillian was talking about, and that is to hear your word. Would you enliven it? Make it come to uh, to life in our hearts and in our minds uh, as it shows who you are and what you are doing and how it calls us out of our existence and our prison cells and our faithlessness and our boredom. It calls us into a life of living that is meaningful and lasting, sometimes difficult and painful, but always worth it. Because you are the one we are following. And so as we open our word, your, or as we open your word, may it touch our hearts. May we have that same fire in our spirit, tears in our eyes that uh, Lillian has when we encounter your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I want to start with a story. We all like stories. Well, most of us like stories. It's an old story of a king long, long ago who was coming near the end of his life, and he had no heir. And so in an attempt to make sure that the kingdom was uh, stable and would pass on into good hands, He proclaimed that because he has no heir, that he is going to pick an heir from the kingdom and through a series of tests would come to the right person to be the next king. Thousands and thousands of individuals showed up to uh, go through the test, hoping they might be one. And test after test after test eliminated some and moved others on into the next test. Till finally, after a period of time and a period of test, there were only three left. Three who had risen to the top. Three who the king thought could be his next heir. But they weren't sure which one. And so they sent them through some more tests, and all three came out equal. And so finally the king devised a test that he felt would show him the next one of the three that should be king. And he said to them, I have devised a test, and it's a test that is very simple, and the winner will be obvious. We'll have a foot race. All three of the contestants looked at each other. They were all in great shape. They all thought they could win. And this would be it. The winner of the foot race would become the next king. As they prepared the next day to, to get ready for the test, a, a, an attendant, a close attendant of the king, came to each, unknown to each of them, but came to each of them and said, the king has his eye on you, and he wants to know your spirit. So tomorrow, as the race begins, and the starter gives the signal to go, don't go until you look to the king and see the sign, and he will give you a sign that you are then to jump into the race, but do not go until the king gives a sign. Each of the contestants were given this secret, mysterious message. Now, as they lined up at the starting, uh, the starting line, they all were nervous. They were all ready to go. The starter was getting ready. The judges were in place to ensure they ran fairly. And each one, at some different point, glanced to see if the king was paying attention. And there was the king. As they got ready and the starter called, on your mark, get set, go, and gave the signal. Nobody moved. Except one of the contestants jumped quickly to to start and then stopped, unsure of what to do, looked at the king, looked at the others, and then took off. 
The second one, seeing the other jump and seeing him looking around also took off because he was afraid he would get ahead and the two of them took off at a dead heat. The third one stood watching the others run, looking at the king, watching the others run, looking at the king. The king appeared as if he wasn't even interested in the race. Nothing was coming from the king, no sign. And he stood there saying to himself, I could still make them. I could still make it. I could still beat them. But the longer he waited, the less his chances of actually beating the others diminished. Until finally he realized, I'll never catch them. And the other two raced on in the race and came to the end in a dead heat. The three of them were brought back before the king. And the king said to them, you, all, you two ran a race well. And he responded to the first. He said, did you not receive the message from my attendant not to leave until I gave you a sign? Yes. Well, then why did you run? Well, I forgot. Hmm. The king said to the second contestant, did you not receive a message from my attendant to wait until you received a sign for me to run? Yes. Well, then why did you run? Well, I saw the other one take off, and I knew that your sign must be coming very soon, and so I jumped to get into the race and not lose ground. Hmm. He said to the third contestant, did you receive a message from my attendant not to run until you receive a sign? Yes. Well, why didn't you run with the others? Because the man responded, you didn't give a sign. And the king said to him, a good king is not just one who acts, but one who knows when to act. And waiting and being patient is far wiser than acting without purpose. You will make a good king. Do you ever have to wait? Do you ever find yourself waiting? Waiting for a prayer to be answered? Waiting for an opportunity to open up? Waiting for a child to return to your family? Waiting to give birth to a child? Waiting to get pregnant? waiting for a test to end, waiting for loneliness to end, waiting for a job to open up, waiting for circumstances to come to a close. Do you ever find yourself waiting? Well, you should, because waiting is one of those tools that God uses most in order to shape and to mold us. Abraham is the father of faith. Do you know why he's called the father of faith, the model of a man who walks with God? Is because he learned to wait. God made him a promise at 75. You are going to have a son from your own body and from Sarah's body. And at 75, he gave the prom God gave him the promise. God did not fulfill that promise for 25 more years. And in Romans chapter 8, or 4 rather, in verse 18, we see the effect that waiting had on Abraham against all hope. Yeah, no kidding. 75, you're going to have a kid. 99 still hasn't had the kid. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it said to him, so shall your offspring be. See, God had promised him many offspring. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. I, I, I think he came to the conclusion, at 100, I'm not likely to be having any more kids, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. And yet, he didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. What promise? You're going to have a son. But was strengthened in his faith and he gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. He was the man of faith, and through that faith became a powerful force for God, a powerful person in the work of God, because he learned to wait. Now, if you want to know how he struggled at times, just go back and read the story. He wasn't always perfect, but he learned to wait. 
Remember in James chapter one, maybe you don't, James says that perseverance, and you could translate that word with waiting, produces in us perfect work, and we must wait for it so that we'll be mature and complete, lacking nothing. That's what waiting produces in us. It brings us to maturity. It fills in the places that are empty and that are lacking, that are broken. It, it, it leads to the healing of areas that need to be healed. It makes us strong and mature. It gives us wisdom. That's what waiting does. You're not going to avoid it. It is one of God's most common tools in the workshop of our lives. And so, if you're waiting, you're right where God wants you to be. Exactly where God intends you to be. The thing is, with waiting, it never feels that way because we want to, to go. We, we want to run. We want to be uh, in action. And we're looking and looking and saying, give the sign, let me go. And God says, wait. Because in the waiting is when the change happens. Now, God doesn't only just do that in, and by the way, let me just say, if you're in a waiting period, you're not there by accident. God is doing his work in you. But waiting always requires time. And you choose whether you're going to trust him in the waiting or jump in and start running. Now what God does with us as individuals, he's also done with us as a race. We've been studying the Bible from an overview, a 30,000 foot level, looking at the major movement of what the Bible is about. And we had six C's, right? God created the world and then man fell, rebelled against God and brought consequences that are devastating in this world. We see them in the news all the time. But then God created these things called covenants, which were his promises to mankind, us as a race, of how he was going to rescue us from our brokenness and our sin and our separation from him and restore us in relationship. So there was the creation, there was the consequences of the fall, there's the covenants. And then after the covenants came the cross as Christ came and, and gave his life on the cross to pay for our sin and reconcile us to God. And then after Christ rose from the dead, he created this thing called the church, which is what we are, it's his body, it's how he's working in the world today. And then ultimately, in the end, he is going to bring it all to a conclusion and he's going to bring about a whole brand new creation where the consequences of our sin are done and finished and over and we are back in an environment of perfection and God was making these promises all through the Old Testament these covenants he made one to Adam hey your descendant is going to destroy the one the evil one that has led you into sin he will overcome him he made a promise to Abraham that that one of your descendants is going to bless all the nations of the earth and 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 come to an end bring to conclusion the consequences that have come from the decision of Adam and Eve then he said to Moses, one will come who will be like a lamb, sacrificed so that you may be restored to God. He promised David, one would come who would build a house for God, a kingdom for God, and he would rule over forever. Isaiah said one would come full of the spirit and, and, and would lead people back to God and would suffer on their behalf to bring them into right relationship. Ezekiel said a shepherd will come and will shepherd the people and lead them back to God. Jeremiah said one will come who is full of the spirit and will start a new covenant, one that is based on the heart, not the outward action. All these promises have been made, and it's been years, decades, centuries, millennia that God has been making these promises, and yet the one has not come. Mankind has been waiting. Waiting. Until finally, like the sun breaking in the dawn, breaking its light into the darkness, piercing the darkness and flooding the world with light, comes the one. And in Luke chapter three, we are given an account of the coming of the one. In Luke chapter three, verse one, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, 
who was Caesar of Rome. When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Eturia and Trachonitis and Lysinus, Tetrarch of Abilene, there are just places around modern day Israel. During the reign of Herod the Tetrarch, during the high priest of Ananias Caiaphas, the word of God came to John Zechariah, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Now, why all these details? It's because this, what Luke is going to tell can be tracked to fact. This is not a myth. This is not a story that was made up. That, you know, Jesus kind of, everybody thought he was really special. Well, let's, let's, let's make a story about this and we'll turn him into a savior and we'll, we'll make up stories around it. This is a real person who came at a real time. This is not a myth this is a fact sometimes we forget that that we were following a real person who did what the scriptures say he did this is not a faith made up on stories that aren't true this is a faith that is based in the evidence and the life of one who is the son of God who entered this world Your faith is not made up of cleverly crafted stories that really have no history to them. It is made up of truth. And you can track that truth to fact. Well, in that time, John went into the country around the Jordan and he was preaching a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. Now, John is not the one that was promised. 600 years previous to this, Isaiah, the prophet, said, one will come and prepare the way of the Lord. One is going to come. When the Lord is ready to come, there'll be one just ahead of him that's going to prepare the way. And here's John preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, This, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. And that's metaphorical language to say there'll be no great people and low people like there is in the world of every era. But when it comes to the one who is coming, everything will be equal, everybody will be the same. Why, because they're born the same, they have the same money, they have the same skin color? No, because in God's sight, every man, every woman is the same and all must come to him. God is not impartial. He does not favor people over others because of some external appearance or some accomplishment that they have made. With God, we're all the same. We all come the same way. And he says, the crooked roads shall be made straight, the rough way smooth. There won't be crooked roads to get to God. It won't be hard to find him. The way is gonna be obvious and clear and the same for everyone. And that's why John preaches a baptism of repentance, because the way is repentance. No matter who you are, there's only one way to God. The same for all people. So John says the crowd's coming out to be baptized by him. (laughs) This makes me admire John. You brood of vipers. How would you like that? A little bit of preaching like that. You brood of vipers. Now that wasn't a compliment. John was a straight shooter. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? See, it assumes there there is judgment coming. Produce fruit. And keeping with repentance. It's not about what you say. It's about what you say and what you do. Your life and your words have to. Don't tell me you're following God if your life doesn't at all exhibit obedience. I don't want that crap around here. What are you saying? It's a lie. It's the stuff snakes deal in. And don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father, maybe kind of modernized, but don't begin to say to yourself, well, I go to church, I pray. What's that got to do with anything? For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. 
The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how great you are or how low you are. If you do not have repentance in your heart and the right attitude toward God and faith in him, it's not going to turn out well. Now let's talk about those two things just for a second. Repentance. Well, there's a theme everybody loves to talk about. <laughs> it's just one of those things that even in our Christian circles we don't like. I mean, it's all through the scriptures. It's the call for all of us. I'll be honest, I don't like it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, especially if somebody else is pointing out something in your life that you need to repent of. To turn away from it and turn back to God. There's, there's, well, sometimes it's pride. Well, nobody's going to tell me. And sometimes it's self. Well, I don't want to leave that. I'm enjoying that. Sometimes it's ignorance. And that's the message. It still is the message, and here's why. It's the message because we'll never truly be free from our bondage to sin until we first admit that we have failed. Until words like, God, I watched that again and I know I shouldn't have watched it. Or, you're right, I did gossip about her. Or, I did envy him and the promotion or the, the things that he has, the trips that he can take. I did lust after her. I did lust after him. I had evil thoughts in my head. I do explode and struggle with anger. I am constantly f struggling with anxiety over things I know I shouldn't struggle with. I hate that person from my heart. Until there are words like that that are coming out of our mouths that reveal the truth of what's in our hearts, we're never going to change. And that's why John preached repentance. You have to leave the way that you're living now and you have to start by telling, confessing and repenting, saying, God, this is true of me and I want to be free from this. And you know, I have found, I don't know about you, I have found that sin is kind of a daily event in my life. That when I really think about how I spoke to people or what I, why I did what I did or what I did sometimes, eh, it, it, it's not many days where I can say I didn't sin today. I've just become good at ignoring it. It's not that it isn't true, it's just that I'm getting better at ignoring it all the time. But repentance is me saying, God, this is true and I want to change. So help me to change. Help me to battle. I know I'm going to fight this but give me the strength and the grace to keep fighting till I start experiencing victory. Fill me with your spirit. Do you know, if, if sin is a daily event, maybe repentance ought to be a daily event. In fact, I would suggest that maybe at night, the last thing you do when you lay your head down is say, God, let's just talk about our day. Show me where I may have said something or thought something or did something, was motivated by something that wasn't honoring to you because I, I want to make it right. Let that be your last thought and that tomorrow, God, maybe I can do better with your help. I think we ignore repentance too much and maybe that's why we're stuck in some of the actions and thinking that we have. Maybe that's one of the reasons we're stuck. I'd suggest that might be a really good discipline for all of us to do each night. But there's another thing John talked about. He talked about baptism. And baptism is a celebration. It, it's a symbol that you have repented and turned to God. In fact, I wanted to just remind you of some of the choices, it's all young people too, that have made to obey Jesus. This is a recap of what has happened. Let's see that video of the baptisms. Cool. Based on your profession of faith, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Okay, it is my absolute privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bella, do you believe today that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and He died for your sins? Yes. 
we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you really believe that Jesus died for you? Yes, I do. Do you believe he rose from the dead? Yes. Do you really want to serve him all the days of your life? Yes. Then on the confession of your faith, and as one of those that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Natalie, it's been such a joy for us as your family to watch you grow in your faith. Um, so today, do you declare Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Fantastic. So because of your profession of faith in Christ and in obedience to his command, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Based on your profession of faith, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord? Called to do if we've put our... I just wanted to show that because I love watching these baptisms. Funny, it was all girls, young women leading the way. Maybe some of our men need to step up too. Maybe you do. Maybe you're 55 or 48 or 72. It doesn't matter who we are. The statement of John is repent and be baptized. And that same message is carried through the church. Maybe that's a step for you to take, is to be baptized and declare your faith and trust God that he'll help you take that step. Well, John's preaching becomes so amazing that people are like, you must be the one, you must be the one, you must be the one. And John keeps saying, no, 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 I'm not the one. I'm the one that's been sent ahead. One will come who will baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. And they're like, why do you have to be the one? And he keeps going, no, I'm not the one. And so then what do you think the question of these people is after seeing John preach with such power and people coming out and being baptized and revival taking place as people repent and be baptized and turn to follow God, what do you think the question on the mind of the people watching him is? Well, then if you're not the one, who is? Now Luke is the writer and he picks up that question with what he says and tells about Jesus next. He tells us three things about Jesus. Suddenly Jesus comes onto the scene. In verse 21, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now, I love a good baptism, and I've been to quite a few of them, but I have never, ever, ever seen when somebody came up of the water that a dove came down, the, the form of a dove lighting on the person and a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well. I've never seen that, and I don't think you have ever seen that, and I don't think they had ever seen that. This is unusual. Amen. Yeah. So why now? The tie-ins with the Old Testament promises here are just flowing out of this text. Heaven is opened and the Spirit comes down. Remember that, that Jeremiah and Isaiah all said that he would have the Spirit on him, the one who was coming would have the Spirit on him in a way in which he would dispel 
dispense the Spirit and create a new covenant by putting the Spirit within you. Th- that, that the one that was coming would be anointed by the Spirit and, and in a, such a spectacular way that he would start something new in you and with God. And here comes the Spirit alighting on Jesus. And then a voice came from heaven, heaven, you are my son. Now, (laughs) to David, God had promised, I am going to raise a descendant up from you, and in that, he says, and I'll be his father, and he will be my son. I mean, nobody thought God was talking literally. But here's the son to the father who was promised to David. And by, he sure has great credentials with the spirit coming down and the voice booming from heaven. And look what he says about the son. I am, with you I am well pleased. When was the last time God said that about a human? You have to go all the way back to Genesis. And he looks at Adam and he goes, looks at his creation and God says of all parts of his creation including Adam and Eve I am well pleased but then what happened well Adam and Eve sinned they disobeyed they rebelled and they fell from a position of favor and approval by God and nobody gets that uh, that statement about them until this one the second Adam Now, in the minds of the people watching, flags are waving right now. I mean, if a voice from heaven and a spirit come down doesn't make you take interest, then certainly the tie-in to the prophecies that they've been waiting for ought to take your attention. Well, the next thing that Luke talks about, he says, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began the ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Math or Mathat, the son of Levi, and da 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 in the genealogy. This is the part you skip when you're reading here. Because they're the son of the son of the son of the son of the son. And most of the names you wouldn't be familiar with unless you uh, delve into the Old Testament, but there's three names you probably might recognize, might have heard from time to time. He is the son of David, he is the son of Abraham, and he is the son of Adam, according to Luke. Now, what promises did God make to Adam? He said, there will become one from your line, from your flesh, who will overcome and defeat the evil one who has usurped the kingdom away from you and and led you into sin. There will come one from your line who will stomp the one who has destroyed you. There's a descending coming. And then what did he say to Abraham? There is one coming from you, a descendant of yours, who will bless the whole world by turning on its head the consequences of the actions of sin by your parents, Adam and Eve. There's one coming. And then what did he say to David? He said, there is one coming who will build the kingdom of God and rule over it forever. One of your descendants. He made all of those promises. They're there in black and white in the Old Testament. We've talked about them. All of those promises, and they will all come through one who is a descendant of theirs, and Jesus is a descendant of all three. Now the lights ought to be flashing. The next thing that Luke tells us about comes in chapter four. Jesus, full of the Spirit, left the Jordan and was, now this is interesting, led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was hungry. And the end, that story ends in verse 13. And when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until another opportune time. Well, in the end, but he left him. Now, interesting what is happening here. This one 
who is the descendant of these three men to whom God had made incredible promises, this one who has the Spirit on him, this one who, who was promised to be a son to the Father, this one who was designated well-pleased, the only other one that God said that about was Adam, and, and now we have this one, the second Adam, and he faces Satan. Now, where have we seen this before? Oh, yeah, in the garden. And, and this time, when Adam first faced the one pleased by, the one who pleased God faced Satan, what happened? Well, well, Satan attacked him, and he folded like a cheap suit, and then we are in the problems we're in because of Adam and his decisions in Adam and Eve and what they did and how they rebelled against God. And now the second one comes, who's well-pleased of God, and he faced Satan, and three times that we know of, there is an implication there may have been more tests in that 40 days, but at least three times we know of, Satan goes head to head with Jesus, and Jesus stomps him all three times. Three and all. And Jesus, why, why, <laughs> why does this, t the, the, Ministry of Jesus start with his baptism and temptation. Why are they the first things? Because God is serving notice. That I'm, the one I have been promising is coming back and he is taking back what you have stolen, Satan. That the work of God is to restore the earth back into the hands of God and back into the one he appointed to rule over this earth, man. He appointed Adam and Eve to rule this earth and he is coming to get it back and to destroy God. Satan has been called what? The God of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the world. He possesses, he owns by, by conquering this world and God is sending the second Adam to say, your reign in this world is over. It's done. And it starts with the second Adam facing head to head with Satan and crushing him. And from here, Jesus will go on throughout the world and he will begin to take ground from Satan. He will begin to do miracles to deliver people. He will cast out demons. He will teach truth that will expose the lies of the evil one. And bit by bit, by bit, he will gain the ground in this little place called Palestine, bringing light and bringing the kingdom of God, constantly saying, the kingdom of God is here. It's come. <laughs> and then he will do the ultimate thing that nobody saw coming. He will die on a cross because it will be on the cross that he will crush the head of Satan, and if that prophecy from Genesis says, oh, he'll bite your heel, he'll hurt you, but you will crush him, and with the cross, Jesus crushes Satan. And then what does he tell the church to do? His followers, who follow him after that. He goes, now here's your mission. I want you to go to every place, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and I want you to kick him out. What do you think our mission is? You think our mission is to create places where we feel comfortable? Do you think our mission is just the salvation of the souls of people? There is no salvation as long as the kingdom of the evil one rules in the lives and the provinces and the countries and the nation of this world. As long as he has sway, as long as there is no light of the gospel, as long as there's nobody standing up to the evil one, he will rule over their life. Our mission is to carry the gospel to defeat the evil one, to stand against him and to bring people to life. That is why we exist. It's who we are. That's our purpose for being here. That the kingdom of God that Jesus started, he intends to spread through the whole world through his church. And by the way, the same spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness is the same spirit with us that leads us into the wilderness of the world where people do not know the hope that is in Christ. So what? Uh, Glad you're excited about this, Ed. <laughs> but, really, so what? Let me give you three so what's. One, 
you need to decide whether you're going to put your faith in Jesus and surrender to him to repent, admit your sin, believe that his death on the cross pays for your sin, and then choose to surrender your life to him and become a part of his kingdom so he will change you from the inside out. That is your choice. Every person must make it. You must make it. Coming to church is not making that choice. Praying is not making that choice. Reading the Bible is not making that choice. Doing good things is not making that choice. It starts with first repentance and faith, and then out of that, God will produce new in you. But you must choose what you're going to do. That's the first so what. There's a kingdom invading this world, the kingdom of Christ, and he's calling people to join him. Will you join or won't you? The second thing is, the second so what, is Jesus gave the church a mission. Sometimes my tendency, and yours, is to make the church a place where we feel comfortable and where we get our needs met and where we can retreat from the world to be encouraged and strengthened and be around people of the same values. Yet we forget that the reason for the church is to disciple, to strengthen and encourage us so that we can go out by the power of the Spirit into the wilderness and do the mission we were called to do. By ignoring that mission, we're ignoring Christ. The very purpose that we're here is very clear, the last command he gave us. A couple years ago, the elders came. We sought God. We believe we heard from God. That God was saying to us for the next, at that time it was seven years, by 2025, I want to, for Springvale to be re invigorated, recommitted, reconnected to the mission. You've, you've gone asleep on me on this. Life has become about you. And I agree, you've got a great church there. But if you're not reaching people, not just is Ed reaching people, is the church doing programs to reach people, are you reaching people? And God said, for the next seven years, I want to focus on them. That doesn't mean we're not discipling people. It doesn't mean we're not trying to build you in your faith. It doesn't mean that this isn't a place where you can come and meet with people that have a like faith that encourages and grows. It means that all that is meant to scatter us out into the world where we connect with our four or our five or our ten or whoever it is, my four, and we say to God, I'm here, you have me here, and I want to reach somebody, and so I'm going to start interceding for them. I'm going to invest love in their life, and I'm going to invite them to whatever is appropriate for them. And God, I'm here on mission. And when I go back to the church, I'm going to be encouraged in the word and in prayer and with other people and in community, but I know it's all so that I can go out and God wants to reinvigorate us as a church on our mission. It's not that he isn't doing the other things in our lives to make us strong. It's that you have fallen asleep on mission. And that's where that vision comes from. And we believe that if we took God serious and engaged, that we would double our impact. We would see double the amount of people. We would see double people live change. We'd see double the impact in our spiritual growth. Because whenever you obey God, you grow. And so the question I have for you is, are you in? And you don't even need to answer it. You just need to answer this. Do you have four? Do you have your my four? That tells you whether you're in or not. Because it's easy to talk about this, but it's in the doing that you know that you're engaged and you're in. So the final so what, I would say, Spiritual warfare is real. Again, I think we've fallen asleep on this one. I think we've bought into the lie. We bought into the lie that Satan and demons were a myth. They're a metaphor for evil, but they're not real. And yet when you read the life of Jesus, they're real. And when you read the life of the apostles in the early church, they're real. And when you lead, read the letters, the epistles, and the commands for us to engage in spiritual for, warfare, to stand against spirits that are moving behind the scenes, 
Paul and Peter and James all seemed to think they were real. So what changed? Why don't we? Uh, on Tuesday, we were in our men's prayer meeting and we were led by the Spirit to pray for our children. So a number of us in there have children that have wandered away from God. And uh, we got praying and then the prayer turned to praying for the spiritual forces at work, the demonic forces that may be leading our children in their thinking and their activity and the, and the situations that they're involved in, leading them away from God. And the prayer became focused on the spiritual warfare going on. And later that day, I got this email from one of the men. You encouraged and challenged me at the same time today. You were correct in our prayer time when you said that this is spiritual warfare against our children and reminded me that the battle for our families is, wouldn't you love to have a dad like this? Reminded me that the battle, men, there's a battle for your family. That the battle for our families is not one on our own doing, but on our knees with God's help. He will be faithful. As it says in Ephesians, our struggle, our battle, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I will also commit to fast and pray this week. Wow. Do you think he thinks spiritual warfare is real? So what? I'm calling us out of our stupor to awaken to the reality of the demonic works around us, to learn how to recognize them and learn how to pray and stand against them. So, Jesus is initiating. We've waited, and now he's here, and he's initiating his kingdom, and the question remains, are you in? Are you on the sidelines? 